we're here to do a session on um, building communities that work and very grateful to you all for taking the time to come and join us. This is the third event in our six event series, um, which we're having a sort of mini festival around community led homes. Um, I've now met most of you at least once on one of these sessions, which is great, um, or, or at a previous conversation. Um, it's really nice uh, that people are finding these conversations useful and I'm you know, really pleased that we're, we're, we're getting to, to meet so many people who are, for whom this is useful and relevant. Um, we've got two people going to speak to us today, Kate from Eden and Lorraine from ACT, um, and they're going to help us explore the idea of building communities that work um, with, the, with the context of community-led housing. Um, I don't want to stifle any conversation at all. The idea of being here is that the conversation gets going um, and that we can take the conversation forward afterwards. So if, you, if you, anything occurs to you while people are speaking, please use the chat function just to record your thoughts, comments, questions, and we'll pick them up between speakers or at the end when we're having a bit more um, varied debate perhaps. Um, really please do just keep chipping in and make sure you get the most out of this session. Um, I think what I'd like to say just before we go into the, the main presentation bits is that from my, my point of view, the conversations that I'm having about housing through the housing hub work um, it, it indicate that housing is seen as a big part in the, the sustainable communities conversation. People are concerned about how to keep their communities vibrant and um, functional. Uh, there are massive issues around affordability of housing and so on, but um, the, the, a, lot, a lot of the conversation comes from the social value of um, good housing mix and uh, making sure that people have safe places to live. So I'm sort of taking this conversation in the context of housing being part of a sustainable communities conversation. Um, but it's not the houses that make the community. And I, and I think that's what I would keep coming back to. The, the, the people work really hard to make communities functional and bright and good. Um, and I think community-led housing obviously lends itself to that. It includes in the name. It's, 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 the, you know, it's a, an approach which um, comes from people who are interested in community. Um, it's very collaborative. It's about building consensus, about working together to get something done, all of which are great for building solid relationships and understandings um, and there's a huge amount of shared work and shared food and shared cups of tea and you know it, it, it creates bonds that tend to last and um, be robust um, so so the houses themselves aren't what are doing the heavy lifting in terms of building communities here it's the people um, and I saw quite a nice summary of this when I was doing a bit, a, a bit of reading around and one of the co-housing um, projects describes, um, well, it, it looks at it in terms of lifestyle um, impact, that sort of environmental impact, and life cycle. And uh, I thought those were three quite interesting words in terms of sustainable communities, um, thinking about the fact that this is hopefully cradle to grave um, provision for people who want to work together and reduce their, um, their impact, well, have a, have a positive impact socially, environmentally, financially, however they, they value um, their, their contribution. So we're going to look at this from a number of perspectives um, and, and please take advantage of the opportunity to make it your own perspective. You know, we, we won't stop. We're not going to draw a line around this and say we're only going to talk about this um, because of what Kate or Lorraine has to say. But I think we're going to see that there's a number of levels of how communities are encouraged and nurtured and facilitated to work. and. Um, the, the context of uh, national policy and sort of regional priorities and district um, uh, strategies are, are all really relevant in shaping how communities can function effectively and, and feel confident to, to do their own thing. So um, we're going to touch on things like access to healthcare, access to education, how we, how we think about those things in relation to functional communities. And, and, and very, very importantly, how, how people get from one place to another, the, the, you know, the real um, localness of, of services and facilities and transport provision, so that we're not constantly saying, well, it's a rural area, everybody needs to have a car in order to, to get to where they need to be. Um, 
so lots and lots of different sort of bits of exploration in this and I and I I'm going to stop waffling on and hand over to Kate Skillicorn who will introduce herself properly but has very generously come along from Eden District Council to talk about how important community-led housing is um, and has it how it has been integrated into their thoughts about um, building thriving communities which is you know it's lovely to see that it's being taken seriously at a at a local policy level so over to you Kate. Thank you friend thanks I'll, I'll share my screen um, okay so you should see a presentation now um, with the title slide building communities that work um, and we've got the subheading, um, as you, you've just talked about really, the um, the question about isn't building the houses enough? Um, and I thought this is a really interesting question and one which leads really well into a discussion about the wider aims of community-led housing schemes. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I'm approaching this from um, two perspectives. Um, so I am um, a project officer in the housing team at Eden District Council. Um, and I'm responsible for the community housing funds there. Um, and I'm also an accredited community-led housing enabler. Um, and in terms of the infrastructure for community-led housing need, we have some active community-led housing groups, including the Patsdale uh, Parish Community Land Trust, who happen to have the most picture-worthy website, um, which we, we can see here. Um, and we're looking to have a supportive registered provider who are experienced in working with community-led housing groups locally to support them through the, community -led uh, the development phase of community-led housing, um, which is Eden Housing Association. Um, and we've also, of course, got the, the Cumbria and Lancaster uh, community-led housing hub. Um, so in terms of um, the, the, the presentation today, what I'm really hoping to try and demonstrate is why community-led housing is usually about so much more than just purely building houses and why this is so valuable to local authorities. So I thought it might be helpful to touch on what the benefits of community-led housing are in relation to building communities at work. Um, so there are lots of established benefits of the community-led housing approach, but purely focusing on why community-led housing can build strong communities and why it's more than just building houses. Um, th this diagram was developed by the Community-led Homes Partnership to show the stages that are involved in a community-led housing project. And the diagram shows how the group, um, or in other words, the community, envelops the whole process. Um, so they're not just involved in consultation at the start of the project, they're involved throughout. Um, and the process is community originated. The starting point is often about the community taking a careful look at what factors might be threatening the strength of their community. Um, and then taking steps to address these factors. And most projects don't come about in isolation from other factors, they are driven by local needs. And community-led housing is an iterative process, so ideas are progressed in consultation with the wider community. They're not presented to them as a, as a finished product at the end of the, the project. Um, and while there can be quick wins, the goal is usually about improving things in the long term. Um, so, so what is it about this that makes community-led housing valuable to local authorities. Um, I think in purely housing delivery terms, community-led housing is an opportunity to add to what standard house builders are providing locally and to increase access to housing for local people and diversify the housing offer. So it, it does, you know, it hits those numbers targets. Um, but in a wider sense, community-led housing can also help councils to address a wider range of corporate aims. Um, and while all local authorities are different, um, there are likely to be common themes within what most local, local authorities are looking to achieve. Um, and so just as an example, we've got um, even District Council, my local authorities' um, priorities here. Um, and you're likely to see common themes such as resilience, thriving towns and communities, health and well-being and economic prosper prosperity, uh, reducing loneliness and isolation. And more recently, many local authorities have also seized upon the climate change agenda um, and the pandemic has put a real focus on what community means and what makes communities work. Um, in recent years, there has, there's been a real push from governments for local authorities to be more commercially focused in order to make up for reductions in funding, essentially. And whilst this is likely to continue, community-led housing is an, an example of an area where there can be great short-term gains, um, but also look real long-term benefits in terms of strengthening existing communities and developing new communities with strong foundations. 
Um, so whichever local authority you're working with, it's likely to be about identifying what the priorities are for them. And most will publish key messages about these on the websites through council or corporate plans. And it's well worth getting in touch with the local authority and having some conversations to get an understanding of which of those objectives are seen as key areas for the local authority. Um, and ideally, you'd hope to find that these aren't surprising really, and these, these tie in with what, you know, your knowledge of what's required locally. Um, so to take Eden as, as an example, we've got four main corporate priorities, which are sustainable, health, healthy, safe and secure, um, connected and creative. Um, so there are some, some obvious links uh, with community-led housing, and obviously those that talk about housing as a starting point, um, but potentially also some ob less obvious ones. Um, so, for example, it could be the case that community-led housing has a potential to help meet objectives such as retaining and attracting a working age population. Um, if community-led housing schemes provide attractive routes to self-build in areas where young people want to live and work, for example, um, you can clearly demonstrate how that scheme could be valuable to the local authority in helping them to achieve some of those wider aims. Um, and to take net zero carbon and renewable, ed renewable energy schemes as another example. Again, community-led housing can be a way to bring forward measures that might not appear in typical developments um, because standard developments need to maximise profit. Um, and it's about emphasising why community-led housing is uniquely well-placed to meet some of those priorities and see where you can identify common names with the local authority really. Um, and I, th I think it's also worth bearing in mind that community-led housing can provide opportunities to unlock sites that wouldn't otherwise come forward. Um, so that there are, are examples of landowners selling or leasing land to community groups that they wouldn't have released otherwise um, because the landowner understands that community-led housing can be a route to development that creates a great legacy for the area. Um, and something that they can be proud to be associated with in the longer term. Uh, so it can be about emphasising what community-led housing can do differently and why, why it is you know, separate from other forms of development. Um, so just to finish off, there, there are some publications out there that can provide further context to help bridge any gaps between communities and local authorities with regards to community-led housing. Um, and the two guides shown here are particularly helpful and include details of best practice in relationships between local authorities and community-led housing groups, um, and also provide examples of some of the barriers that can be encountered and how to address these. Uh, it's also important, I think, to identify an advocate, if not many advocates, um, at your local authority. And the hub would be an ideal first port of call for this. Uh, and also in addition, around 56 local authorities nationally are now members of the um, community-led homes local authority network. Um, and many of the representatives there are accredited community-led housing advisors uh, like myself. Um, so that's an easy way, again, to identify supportive officers and people who will know what you're talking about if you approach them about community-led housing. Yeah. So yeah, happy to take any questions and, and discuss further. I'll unmute myself. Thank you very much, Kate. That's really useful. Uh, um, a, a little dip into um, what Eden District Council prioritises and how community-led housing fits right in. Um, so I was. I, I think it's worth reiterating that uh, wh whichever district um, you you work within, Kate, if you want to stop screen sharing, I'm able yeah. to see. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, th there will be themes coming through which are very similar to the ones you've described, like community resilience and health and well-being and reducing isolation and th those things. Th those are very current and topical wherever you are in the county or the area or in indeed the rest of the country. Um, economic prosperity and climate change are obviously things that all um, public bodies are, are keen on getting communities involved with and thinking about. And um, I think, I think increasingly people are recognising that the diversity of offer that community-led housing brings is, is, is contributing uh, really, you know, uh, has a, having some impact in, in some of those areas and, and allowing people to take some control of what goes on uh, locally. So absolutely reinforce the fact that uh, working with your local authority and finding where you fit um, is, uh, is key. Um, does anybody have any questions for Kate directly? Oh, Helen's got a question, that's great. Well, it's, it's just a point really. Um, I'm, I'm fearful of setting up affordable housing and then it being segregated as a community because you, you get that sort of um, 
people think about affordable housing as in social housing or council housing and we get segregated and we know there's that so mm. I was thinking of putting elderly people and putting on families as, as well in there and um, trying to try, if we can choose who goes obviously if we can yeah we, yeah, we will choose who, who goes in as tenants or whatever mm -hmm. how we're doing it so sort of uh -huh. I wondered yeah. what, what people thought about that as well mm -hmm. okay I think I think the idea of integrated communities is I mean that's obviously part of the building successful communities conversation. I, uh, yesterday we had a whole conversation about how uh, community-led housing fits with um, housing for older people and you know making making sure that we accommodate people's needs as life changes. And um, you could look at that from a lifetime homes perspective and make sure that the homes we build are flexible enough to keep people safe over a long period of changing life needs. Um, but also I think the, from a social and uh, sort of community perspective, the, um, the, the crossing over of need um, dependency, um, uh, you know, the sense in which people feel that they're part of something which isn't stratified into old, young, a rich, poor, you know, whatever the groups are that we might visibly identify with, um, it, it, I think you're absolutely right, Helen, that, that having a community that incorporates um, people at different life stages and with different requirements is, is vital, really. We, um, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing good about building things in isolation. Um, and if we just build lovely houses and put a, a lovely group of people in them, we aren't really sharing the joy, are we? So um, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right to bring it up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has other other thoughts on that because it is interesting the mix of social and um, at market housing that's often required to make community led homes projects mm -hmm. function. Kathy, do you want to chip in? Um, yes, um, I'm Kathy from Hobbs Indian Co Housing Project. Um, yes, I, I think um, in in our in our case, out of twenty units, we have six that are affordable, four that are discount market value, and two that are going to be affordable rents. Um, we, we haven't really had too much trouble recruiting for the discount market value. We put out a couple of feelers and advertisements in the local area and have had very little as far as the affordable rent goes. Um, although I suppose we could just approach the council and say, who's on your list, um, which may be what we have to do in the end. But um, so that's just, I mean, we do want to have a diverse as far as 55 and older, we, we would like to have as, as diverse as possible, but it's it's very much white middle class or so at the moment. And, um, you know, it's just, it's difficult to recruit people. We still have, um, counting the two affordable rented flats, we've got 10 vacancies still to fill. And um, although we've had numerous people interested, um, you know, we still have 10 that we need to fill. So I think it's for us, we want to build a diverse and, um, you know, friendly community, but it's it's still finding the people. That's still our problem at the moment. Uh, th thank you for that. That's really interesting to hear. We, um, one of the things that I, uh, when I was doing a bit of homework, I, I, another thing that I came across in, and it was, a, it was in relation to a co-housing approach and it, um, I think the statement was just something along the lines of trying to undo decades of competitive and selfish, um, you know, uh, kind of policy making contextualization and all, all the rest of it. We're in a situation where people don't expect to have to work with their neighbors, don't expect to have to share facilities, cars, you know, washing machine, whatever it is. And maybe it's just that the co-housing setup is a little bit too far along for, for people who have never thought about living in a communal way. Um, and and it's, it's quite possible that in a more conventional um, housing provision, which could be done with a community led scheme, um, whether, whether that would just be easier for, um, for, for people to, act, to understand. Um, I, th I think much as I love the co-housing model, I think it is challenging for people who haven't thought about um, a more cooperative approach to, to managing where they live. And I can see that that will be an ongoing problem because if you end up 
talking to the local authority about um, people who are on the, on the housing needs list, you put yourself in a position where you have to manage people who haven't bought into your ethos um, in, in, in the way that you were expecting when you set out. And that, that will be challenging, won't it? So it's a really interesting conundrum I don't know if anybody else got anything to offer to that. Sorry, Kathy, do carry on. Yeah, I mean, uh, with, with the talks with the um, council, um, they say, yes, they prefer us to fill locally for the affordable rented flats. But yes, we do have the final say that the people who we do fill the, the, that with um, must agree with our ethos and our vision and values. So, I mean, even though we may ask the council for suggestions, if they don't agree to our vision and values, then we don't have to take them as in like we're not required to because we're still searching for people who do agree with our vision and values yeah but at some point it will become a question of um uh, filling filling the spaces and being viable won't it i mean there's going to be a reality check at some point sorry kate did you want to chip in yeah it was just to, to reiterate what kathy said there really it's just um in terms of looking at balancing the the um the kind of local lettings um ideas for the scheme and then the the wider waiting list you do you come back to the local lettings policy first really so it's whatever you know the scheme um is designed to do um that that is the kind of the default really before you start to look at the list so any, anybody applying from the list would need to as kathy says you know would need to to kind of there need to be that discussion about the ethos of the scheme and how that would work for them so yeah it, it is it's i don't i don't think local authorities would approach it from the way of wanting to put people into the scheme that you know weren't gonna gonna, gonna work there so um yeah it is it's a, a dialogue really yeah thank you okay we'll, we'll keep moving along um we we're going to hear from lorraine next lorraine is my colleague at action with communities in cumbria and um i'm looking forward to hearing what lorraine has to say <laughs> okay hello everybody i'm going to share my screen i've got a few slides for you um hopefully this is there okay are you seeing a slideshow or just a slide just a slide at the moment okay. that's, that's better. better thank Excellent. you that's perfect okay um so my name is lorraine smith as it says i'm the chief exec of act um and i'm going to talk to you about sustainable communities so really following on from what kate said about where even district council are at i'm going to talk about some national policy and relate that to some local examples that I've been involved with around the county and just see how we go. Um, so I think most of you on the call know what ACT is. We're the Rural Community Council for Cumbria and we work with communities in these four ways and we champion community and rural issues. We'd love you to join us if you're not already a supporter. Uh, it's free and uh, it means we can keep you involved and informed of the things we do. And we can also then say that we're meeting the needs of communities across Cumbria from the numbers of supporters we have. So we're really keen to have you involved. I want to use some um, national kind of um, policy levers to talk to you about, similar to what Kate was talking about, but the Rural Coalition is a grouping of national organisations who are advocating for rural areas across the country. And um, during the pandemic, they drew together some ideas about the things that are needed to sustain rural communities. You're gonna get these slides, so don't worry about reading them all. I'm really just gonna talk about the headings. Um, and I think it's really important to think about um, sustainable communities aren't just made about housing. So this is a housing call. But I'm not really going to talk to you about housing. I'm going to talk to you about a whole bunch of other stuff that leads you to think that housing is part of the solution. Because we often have people come to us who say, yeah, we need to build houses to maintain people in our community. But if you don't have more of an offer in your community, then building the houses actually isn't going to work. Um, and the other thing to remember in all of this, and it links into the business planning we were talking about last night, is this is probably a 10-year journey. This doesn't happen overnight. And therefore, when you're doing your planning, you need to be thinking about the future of your community, not your situation as it currently stands, because your situation as it currently stands will have changed by the time you've actually got something built on the ground. And that's, that's a really challenging perspective. Local authorities can help with those conversations, 
There's lots of stats that can help with those conversations. But national policy and the way national policy goes can also inform those conversations. So that's really useful. And having a vision for your rural area. All of this, all of these details relate to kind of national perspectives. But if you're looking, whatever you're looking to do in your rural area, having a vision for how you want it to be in the future is really, really important. Just thinking about and engaging with local people and drawing together a bit of a vision about what you want to be, whether that includes co-housing, whether that's self-build, whether that's a, a low cost, really important to look at that, that vision and, and frame that within what you're trying to do. Economic diversity. It, it, it took me a long time to learn <laughs> because I think communities are wonderful and of course they work. But actually, unless you've got some economic imperative for people to live in that area and to enjoy the environment of that area, then it's quite difficult to make a sustainable community. Is there work in that local area? If there isn't work, how do people get to the nearest place where there is work? What are the opportunities for people to live an economically viable life in that area? And of course, we've got rural communities that are changing very slowly, but also very fast. There's a really big change in agriculture around at the moment. There's a really big change with home working, which may be to the benefit of sustainable rural communities. So it's interesting to think about the economic diversity of your area. It also relates to the affordability discussion that you will have around housing and thinking about um, what people can afford locally. But sometimes the housing that need, that's needed isn't just affordable housing. You actually need a range of different housing in your community. I know that community-led housing tends to be about affordability, but sometimes you have to look at the much wider range of what else is available in your community. So before you can plan your scheme, you need to look at what the needs are in the much wider community. Um, Levelling up is a really interesting one in terms of the conversation that goes on around um, rural residents paying more for the services but receiving less due to the per capita spend at a national level. And what that means is that everything you do in your rural community will cost more because you're doing it at a smaller level. Um, and it's much, some of the market failure, as government would say, that community-led housing is about solving, is about the size of the developments that happen in rural communities. They tend to be the two, three, fours and fives numbers of housing development. And that's not something developers want to do because you don't make money on it. But that might be exactly what a community needs. So the whole levelling up conversation is really interesting on that, on that uh, perspective. Healthcare, civil society and local assets. These are key reasons, as Kate was saying, as um, oh, the lady from the co-housing project was saying, these are key reasons for why we develop these facilities in the first place, why we would look at uh, the local housing issues. Who are you wanting to meet needs of in your community? And are there services in your area that will meet those needs? And this is about the wider planning aspect. I've done some work with a community in the National Park who are aware that they've got some older people, quite a large number of older people in their community living in large houses that are not really meeting their needs anymore. But those houses are part of their family's inheritance. So they want to sell them at market value. But actually the community would quite like to buy those houses at less than market value from those older people and provide something for those older people to stay in their community, but then to attract young families to sustain that community. And this is about community building, but planning policies and opportunities to do that and the money to do that are really, really hard to put together. But they're really, really important because that's what sustains a community longer term. And that's what a housing needs survey can do for you. A community led planning survey can do for you make you aware of the wider issues in the community to help you link those into your planning. And if you're thinking about the wider needs in your community, the conversation in Cumbria is that we've got aging communities. So how can people get access to healthcare if they're living in either remote rural communities or communities on the outskirts of urban areas? Um, will they have access to a chemist? Will there be educational provision, childcare provision, a village hall, good neighbour scheme, a shop? 
milk delivery, doctors, all of those services are really, really important at whatever stage of life you are. And thinking about that in relation to your community-led housing development is really important for the future. Now, of course, <coughs> broadband is going to make, broadband and connectivity is going to make a big difference to all of those offers. But not everybody at the moment has the connectivity or the skills or the desire to do things online. So it's an interesting one. So there we have um, the connectivity issue. And my understanding is that if you're doing developments now, you have to include broadband as part of the package. It's part of the planning planning range that you need to build in a broadband offer as part of, uh, part of your development. And that can be part of the solution to accessing local services. But it would be very sad to see future rural developments based on having good broadband, but no community facilities. So there's a balance there and a conversation in your community about what you've currently got. I had quite a lot of conversations with um, communities where they've said, the only way we can sustain our shop and our school is to have more people living in our community. So we need to do some community-led homes. And I can absolutely see the logic of that, but they've then got to think, so what are we offering new people coming to our community? Where are they gonna work? Where are they gonna get their services? Okay, we'll maintain the village shop. Okay, they might choose to go to the local school, but people make decisions about where they live based on the quality of the local school. So you can't just consider the need for housing. You have to look much broader than that. Travel and transport. <laughs> we've, we've, uh, we've talked to two and a half thousand people over the last few years about what they think the key issues in rural communities are. And travel and transport comes up every time. People want a bus. <laughs> it's that straightforward. And we always want to talk to them about the fact that it's, a bus probably isn't the solution. Because how many of us have seen buses wandering around Cumbria empty? So we need to be looking at different solutions. The pandemic has caused quite a challenge on that because communal transport isn't quite the thing at the moment. But it will come back because it is part of the solution. And nationally, there's a, there's a real drive for communal transport to make that be the way to do it and also around the environment if we if we all own and love our cars which we kind of feel we need to it's challenging how will you build that into your um into your planning will you put ev charging facilities within your within your housing um will you have enough car spaces for our three household cars that um are increasingly becoming the norm or will you be promoting the concept that you should be able to plan for um, sustainable transport in other ways around your community? The St Cuthbert's um, village planning up in Carlisle, the new garden village, is supposed to have integrated transport as part of that planning. And that's really interesting in terms of health and well-being. The idea is that um, wherever you live on that new garden village, you will have access to public transport. That was built in before they even did the designs for the homes. And it's just interesting for community groups to think about those sorts of access issues as well. Affordability. Um, it's a really complicated issue. Um, and it relates to where your money comes from to make your project work. So um, if you've got Homes England money, there's affordability processes you have to go through. Um, there's regulations and rules, but I've worked with quite a lot of community groups who want to make the affordability less than the nationally recognised affordability criteria. And therefore they're stepping out of the norm and they have to have different conversations with districts and funders around that. But they recognise that the national affordability does not work in their community. Even in I'm working with a community in South Lakeland who is not considered to be deprived in any way. But as part of their scheme, they're recognising that people will not be able to pay what is considered an affordable rent. So they're trying to build in and create their management process such that they can let those homes for less than the nationally and the locally affordable rent. So again, it's, it's a big issue. This is a housing call. Most of the communities we talk to 
and not considering housing because it's such a big issue. It's just so hard and it takes so long. As I've already said today, we're talking 10, 12 year process. And that's from start of an idea to actually getting something on the ground. Sometimes it's faster, but often that's, that's the sort of process it takes. Um, and so we try to encourage communities in their community planning and their vision to think about what would make a difference to their community. And that might mean supporting the village shop, that might mean supporting the village school, that might mean a housing, system, a housing process, but it also might mean looking at existing housing in the area and renovating or changing the way people use that housing. So the, the, the solution isn't always new build. There's a lot of other ways to look at it. And I think we've learned a lot during the pandemic about rural, rural dependencies. So wherever you do your development, where's the nearest service centre? Um, do you have visitors in the area where you're going to be developing? Do you need to manage privacy and rights of way and access around the, the, the thing you're developing? Are there pressures between the visitors to your area? And how do you think about and have the conversation with second homeowners in your area? I know of one community where a second homeowner decided that when they were going to sell their second home, they decided they wanted to sell it to a local person. And they took a 10 grand drop in their income from selling that home in order to make sure a local family lived in it so that they were sustaining the community. That is such a selfless act, and I'm not suggesting you will see that very often, but it's a conversation to have with the wider community. I know Charles is involved with, um, with a housing association where quite a lot of the homes they manage, not MITRE, quite a lot of the homes they manage um, are donated when people pass on. And they're donated in order to allow local people to stay living in the area at a reduced cost. So they get, again, there's a, there's an issue there about the dependencies of the rural areas and sustaining rural life. So this is, this is a very, very big issue. Um, you can get access to the Rural Coalition ideas there. They've produced a document for the last of five years, so you can see the changes in that kind of policy perspective. And it's just interesting when you're thinking about your scheme to think about the wider issues and how that relates for your community. In summary, I would say it's always about more than the housing, which Fran has said, which uh, Kate has said. Community-led housing is always about more than housing. And that means that you're not just doing a project about housing, you're doing a project about sustaining your community. And uh, that's really hard, but there's lots of support processes to help you. And um, I hope that's been helpful. That's me finished, Fran, I'll stop Thank sharing. you very much. Thank you, Lorraine, that's great. That's brilliant. Um, that that a really helpful um, sort of overview and reminder of a, a number of things that I think we're probably all conscious of. That um, it, this isn't a if we build it they will come situation necessarily. Um, your your community needs to have other things going for it other than the, the availability of housing to be attractive to people wanting to, to, to make it attractive so people want to come and be with you. Um, and looking at all of those things that Lorraine mentioned about um, the availability of services, schools, houses, healthcare, it all goes together um, to build uh, something which is recognizably able to sustain the community that you're trying to build. So um, it's, it is really interesting and complex and slightly daunting and um, I'm pleased that you've opened up the can of worms about existing housing stock and the, 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 the dysfunctionality we have around parts of the market at the moment. And that, that, I think, if I'm being completely honest, I think that might be slightly out of the scope of the conversation we want to have today. But I just want to open that up just for a moment and say that we're not just talking about existing housing stock, we're talking about existing buildings and actually sometimes there are opportunities when buildings become um, vacant for one reason or another that, that can be really creatively reimagined. And um, that, that's a terrific opportunity, it has been done very well in some urban areas. And there are some opportunities in Cumbria and beyond um, for other 
other types of building, not not just houses that are that we look at and think, oh, we could fit more people in there, couldn't we? But you know, um, I'm I'm being a bit facetious, but I'm I'm just trying to say that, that there are some really tricky parts to this conversation. What strikes me about both um, what what Lorraine's just said and what Kate's just said is that there's a strong theme of um, I hesitate to use the phrase, but there's something like civic pride, which uh, you know, there's a there's a wanting to be part of a place wanting to identify with a place, feeling proud to be there, be part of it, which is really very intangible um, and really different. It's a hard sell, but it's very, very real. Um, and it makes a big difference to how, um, you know, how, how projects, ideas, um, conversations are received. If people feel um, instinctively that there's, there's a, um, a reason to be proud and, people wanting to join your club as it were isn't that a lovely position to be in but that that's really what we're trying to that's all we're talking about there is a sense of um powerful communities making things happen and i think that's a, a um just different language for what may be called civic pride i don't know maybe i'm m m m people might do better at, at a definition but I, I just thought there was a theme coming through which was about wanting to share what's good about where I live um, or um, it, or indeed to make better so that more people want to be part of it. OK, so we've got we've actually got 45 minutes if we need it. And if we don't, that's absolutely fine. I don't want to keep you here any longer than is useful to you. Um, but we've got 45 minutes to have a, a discussion about what we've heard and to bring forward any ideas about what you're doing or what you're thinking. Um, I can see that Judith's already got her hand up, so that's great. Um, we might as well just dive straight in unless Anyone wants, well, no, we'll go in with Judith and, we'll, and then we'll, we'll um, see where we get to. Okay, thank you. I was just going to start about the fact that some communities have tried to do housing of different forms and failed, but then I don't see it as a failure because quite often it's brought the community together, had good discussions, then sometimes take on other challenges or just manage to work together better when they have a crisis or a problem. And it's got different people in the community talking to each other. Some people occasionally talk about a community, but I quite often think of it as a lots of different communities just happen to be in the same geography. And quite often they don't know about each other. They don't trust each other. They just haven't got knowledge of each other's lives. And quite often you'll get a housing project or sometimes opposition to a housing project. And it'll actually get people talking to each other about what's important and what's happening. So sometimes people have felt they failed as a community because they haven't succeeded in a project, but it's actually done a really good job of bringing people together and they then succeed in other ways in the future. I think that that's really good. That That's exactly the sort of resilience that Kate was talking about. I think that the, the sense in which communities build their own power through um, working together to, to solve problems and explore issues. Um, Kate, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, that, I suppose it, it links a little bit to, I think it was Helen was, was um, referring to the issue around kind of stigma in, in providing for um, for different groups as well. And I, I think in some ways it ties back to that in terms of you're addressing, um, addressing issues within the community um, from, from a, a wider perspective as, as through more dialogue with with local people, it's, it kind of it helps to overcome that that issue of stigma because you, you're saying these people aren't other; these are people within our community who we're working with and who are involved. And yeah, I think it's 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 all related, really. But it's um, it, it is an advantage of community-led housing that you can have these discussions and say where where are the gaps locally, and um, and that that again it just it links back to that addressing those stigma issues, really, and. Um, it's not something that's being done to the community. It is. It is originated within within the area, really. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Did you have something to add, Lorraine? You, you... Yes, I was just thinking about the um, the thing that comes before the provision, which is the planning and the conversation, which was what Judith was referring to and Kate, and that's what creates the less the less otherness about it, because the community has identified what it needs and what it wants. And as Judy says, even if you don't get to the housing, along that process, you will create so many good links and networks and opportunities that people can do other things with. So I, I always talk to community housing groups about their journey, which is going to be a long one. Always. There's no way there's no way around that. It's going to be a long one. 
So what are the successes they build as they go? How do they keep themselves enthused and involved when they've got to deal with solicitors and land agents and Homes England and all the rest of it by having some of these smaller things that they can achieve along the way that they're not necessarily responsible for making happen, but that they're awakening their community to the fact that those things are important to them and that there are people in the community who could do them, which is why having a parish council involved in your project is a really useful thing because they can hold that longer term. They can also be the people who most object to you doing a community-led housing project. So that's quite interesting. And there's a thought kind of wandering through my mind about um, the people who object to housing are usually thinking about things that happened 10 or 15 years ago when housing associations used to put anybody into social housing. They don't do that anymore. The policy has changed fundamentally. And there's a real job for us to make people aware that that policy has changed and that housing allocation policies are much more intelligent than they used to be. So many rural communities I talk to won't do housing because they don't want somebody from Newcastle placed in their community, for instance. But that's not the way it works anymore. Local housing allocation policies are just a lot more intelligent. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I was just, I'm going to put Bronwyn on the spot and just see if there's anything you want to bring in at this point from Patterdale, because I, you're, you're coming at this from a, a slightly different perspective with your partnership with Eden Housing Association. And I, and you're listening to us talking about affordability and connecting um, housing with community. And I wonder if you've delved into that in the, the, the build up to your project um, in terms of how integration will take place or whether you're assuming that the tenants in those new houses will be naturally in integrated because of the local allocations policy. Uh, are you happy to, to, to explore that? Yes, I think, well, I think there's a couple of things. One is I'm really glad to hear Lorraine say how long this takes um, because <laughs> um, it does take a very long time. I think that um, we have the advantage that this was originated by someone whose family's been in the valley for generations um, and housing needs surveys have been done repeatedly since, Kate will probably remember, but probably since about 2005. Um, so we have a strong idea about what housing we need here. I think um, we have a very strong community here. Um, and I think that that was um, increased by, storm, by the need to respond collectively to Storm Desmond. Um, the person who initiated all this, the local I was mentioning, is on the parish council. So um, the parish council is immensely supportive. And we have many of the other things here that Lorraine mentioned. We have an outstanding little school and we have a very active church. And we have lots of um, hobby groups and community groups. And by and large, they have a good mix of incomers and outcomers. I think that um, we're very limited in terms of potential sites, partly because of Storm Desmond, because for whatever reason, because lots of people have theories about why we flooded so badly, and one, you know, one is about you know, poorly maintained drains, but there's a lot of potential area for housing now that is categorized, categorized at risk. So that, that is a real tension for us. And there is a tension between the site we're currently trying to develop and people's views of that because it's so iconic um, almost. And people are hard to realize that actually finding the site is really a challenge. I, I do think what Lorraine says about um, you might be able to identify people who would be prepared to sell you land that they wouldn't otherwise have sold just because of what you're doing. I think that's true. And we're in the process of, you know, really, really sort of working on that. But the, I know you don't really want to talk about this, but for me, as you probably guessed, as a foreigner, the biggest threat to this village is actually people buying houses, spending millions of pounds uh, on them and never being here. Um, and they and many of those are the people who will object to our developments. And, and I think that, that I think that's a real issue. And the other really big issue for us here this year was this um, tension between 
being absolutely swamped with people who don't know how to behave in the countryside. The rubbish, the problems we had with rubbish here were just unbelievable. And I don't, I don't really know how we're going to deal with that this summer. But anyway, that's almost an aside. The other thing I wanted to say was that um, Kate's been absolutely invaluable in this process. We would never have, we would never have got as far as we've got without Kate. I mean, her patience with my writing of a business plan was just <laughs> phenomenal. Um, and so I think I think you really have to um, maximise the, the the skill set that's available to you in in the local authority. Really. Can I just quit there to say thank you, but it has it's been a joy working with the group throughout. Really. You do, you know, a very easy group to work with, so. <laughs> yeah, but we, we started from a pretty low skill base, Kate, in terms of, um, I'd never written a business case in my life because I'd always had managers to do that. And so um, we started from a very low skill base and Kate was incredibly patient with revision after revision. So now we're very grateful, actually. It's been, it's, been, it's been very instructive. And of course, you have to build the skill set in the community. Um, and that's, that. I mean, in our community land trust, we have a really good mix, I think, of ages and incomers and outcomers. But actually, finding the people who've got the time and are willing to develop the skill set um, and have the patience actually is, I think, a really big part of big part of the challenge if you are going to to get somewhere. And I I completely take on board that um, you build lots of other things in the process, but actually, if you want if what you want is affordable housing, is in the end you want some houses. Um, and and having the people who can stick with that and know how to learn to do it is a really big challenge, I think, in, particularly in small communities. I think the other point you wanted me to address was the um, relationship with the Housing Association. Well, we've chosen that model really because this is such a small community. We didn't feel, um, you know, we're very happy with the local lettings policy, um, but we didn't feel that in a small community we could take on the management role. We thought that that would be... Um, that would lead to too much potential conflict. And, the ch and one of the challenges we have in setting up a 125 year lease to the Housing Association is how we uh, ensure that there is community involvement going forward. Um, but, but there is good, there is good, we've got you know, a good legal team who are sort of helping with us that, and the Housing Association is very um, supportive of that um, notion. So I, th I think the relationship between um, Cade exemplifying the council, the housing association and us has, is actually working extremely well now. There's no doubt about it that it, it, it looks like a successful project from the outside. You know, it, it's got all the right ingredients and it's moving very, believe it or not, very rapidly in the right direction. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, thank you very much for that, Bronwyn. It's, it's really useful to hear from you um, because I know, I know you're coming at this from a slightly different um, place to some of the other parts of the conversation. Mm. But um, it, it's interesting uh, to think about the detail of local allocations policies and whether, we're, whether what we're interested in in this community's conversation is uh, geography and whether having a 10 mile boundary or a 20 mile boundary or um, a local connections policy you know all of those things come into the conversation when looking at allocations and how we build new people into our com existing communities and your community the way you describe it is is um well served by in a number of ways it's a desirable place to live mm. um the, the the battle you have is um affordability gen you know real affordability not just um on paper mm. affordability mm. but the fact that people who live there and work on local wages simply can't afford to do the mm. housing things they need to do. So um, it's, it, it, it really is an interesting set of um, questions about who, who, who to prioritise for those houses. And, uh, and I think the, mo the more um, involved we can all be in those conversations with the housing associations and, and exploring the, the allocations, the better really. So. Uh, Hats off to you and, and getting stuck in. It's it's great to see. We do we do have a local list of people who want um, affordable housing, and that and c that currently is about twenty households, which is a lot in a community this size actually. And and we have looked at repurposing buildings, but um, it's it's the cost it's 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 the cost of of purchase of buildings 
Um, there's, there's not many we could repurpose actually, um, but it's 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 the cost that's really really um, prohibitive. Yes, yes, it can be. Yeah. yeah, you know, you can't you can't even begin to think about you know the community land trust, for example, getting a mortgage or um, because you couldn't you can't you can't square off the cost of the housing um, with any conversion cost and affordable rents. It just doesn't it just doesn't square off. But, no. but we haven't discounted that as a sort of future possibility. Good. Nice to see ambition for the future. Good. <laughs> um, I'm going to choose somebody else now. And I'm sorry, Jez, I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute because your um, take on this conversation about uh, building communities from a Carlisle perspective will be very different again from what we've been talking about, but it will have all of the same ingredients. Um, are you are you happy to talk to us for a few minutes about what what your? Um, yeah, I was interested to get tips on what you do. I mean, obviously we were a partner in setting up the hub, and we had a, a group in Carlisle, Sustainable Carlisle, that had existed for a number of years and seemed to blow a bit hot and cold. And we hope that that setting up the um, you know, setting up the hub might be a catalyst for that or other groups to come forward and also encourage people, some of the people in our custom and self-build register um, maybe to get involved. But, um, you know, unfortunately, the take up there has been uh, disappointing. Um, I mean, moving forward, um, I think Lorraine mentioned the Garden Village before, we'll have um, policies, there's policies in the draft local plan about including elements of self-build on larger schemes there. So hopefully that will include, encourage more people to come forward as communities in the medium to longer term. It's certainly something we like to encourage more, but um, it has been uh, quite challenging to, to get things moving in Carlisle. I suppose most of our stock's more urban, but you know, we do have a large rural hinterland as well and there's no reason that couldn't work in urban areas as well you know certainly you know we've had Andy Lloyd come and talk to a lot of groups down the years both when he was with the Rural Housing Trust and uh, more recently but um, it is something we really struggle to uh, get off the ground in Carlisle that we you know we would be keen to uh, to do more of so you know oh, yeah we did run a self-build event one time at Carlisle College as well and um, there was another one someone else organised that we, you know, we got involved in. So, you know, we have tried to get a bit of publicity for that sort of thing. But, um, at the, you know, at the moment, it's been fairly disappointing. That's a, thank you. I'm not, I don't mean to uh, haul you across the coals or anything. I'm, uh, all I want to do is to talk about um, uh, your perspective on um, building successful communities, I suppose. And obviously, for this conversation is coming from a community led housing yeah. perspective. But... The Garden Village does seem like um, an extraordinary project in terms of the ambition to build a new community, in a sense. And I just just wondered if there was anything that you wanted to bring forward about that and, and the priorities that, are, that are, have been sort of escalated there about, I don't know whether it, whether whether from your perspective it looks like um, almost new town new village sort of provision or whether it is about connections into the the, the city and um growing carlisle rather than growing new um uh, villages on the outskirts Ap apologies if that feels like an unfair question but i'm, I'm just trying no, to explore the um, ingredients what, of building good communities and, and what your take on you don't often get that with a blank piece of paper or almost blank piece of paper for and it's about you know new housing employment infrastructure that the, you know the, the links and green corridors and stuff into the town and everything and you know one thing around that would be around you know one element of that it's about housing for workers young people you know older people um self-build it's about that sort of um whole element really so you know it's that sort of you know the, the community uh build elements if we can incorporate some of that possibly as part of the uh, you know the self-build allocation on larger sites people come in together then that would be really positive but um, you know it's quite a uh, large overarch you know it's looking at sort of a number number of um, settlements you know linked settlements to the uh, south of Carlisle rather than one big sort of uh, you know uh, you know it's not it's supposed to be sort of um, 
rather you know unpleasant urban extension at all it's you know it'd be really attractive design linked to you know new infrastructure and the, the road facilitating that and everything so yeah, yeah. Sure it's positive moving forward and hopefully community uh, led development can be uh, you know part of that brilliant yeah I, I, i've seen i mean I, I i it's on the periphery of of, of um things that i'm i'm aware of and i i'm always impressed by the um, the prioritising of uh, what, you know, the ingredients of the community. It doesn't seem to be just about plonking houses down and running away, which is great. <laughs> um, but um, interesting to think about the mix of houses and what's driving that. And I'm sure that a lot of research has gone into the background of what's required. Um, is, there, is there a sort of, um, apologies for the detail, but I'm, is there a sort of um, expectation about uh, market housing and percentage of affordable housing or is that is that less of a conversation um, no, the... um my colleagues have been doing a lot of work around viability on that um, i mean currently in carlisle we have a zoned approach linked to viability where in some areas it's 30 percent in some areas it's 20 percent and we're at the point of um you know, doing the initial consultation on the local plan there the, the draft local plan there uh, that my planning policy colleagues uh, have been working hard on. And initially the suggestion is, uh, certainly the idea is that it would be 20% affordable housing, which is less than currently having some other areas. But the, the problem is it's around viability because developers will have to make uh, contributions towards other infrastructure as well, you see, uh, like on highways and school places. It's not just the affordable housing, there's a lot to, uh, you know, there's a lot of other section one, well, we talked about phasing out section one, but a lot of other developer costs, whether it's section one or six or the new levy or whatever, um, there are a lot of uh, additional um, expenses that developers will have to uh, put towards in order to deliver that around the overall infrastructure. So unfortunately, it isn't just um, affordable housing would be asking to uh, pay for so provision of the, I know they're looking at 20%. Okay, thank you. Thank, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot there, but thank you very much for... for yeah, I'll for get you back, don't worry. <laughs> 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 <On> your toast. <laughs> um, I can see that Judith still has her hand up. I don't know if you're trying to chip in or if it's just a permanent feature, but... <laughs> no, I'm, I, was, uh, I did have something I was going to put in. Sort of, um, the thing is, we've moved on to different bits, but it's, it's great. It was just, in a way, going to put on... What I enjoyed was when... Um, I was talking to parish councils or people like Keswick Community Housing Trust, telling the stories of the people who were in housing need, um, stories of young people who'd grown up in Keswick but then had to move to Workington, were commute, commuting back for jobs, commuting back to look after elderly parents. Um, I remember when I was doing a housing needs survey in Grasmere many years ago, a story of a, somebody who was working in a family business in Grasmere but was having to live up near in Carlisle in the rural areas because that's where they could afford somewhere to live with with their girlfriend. And they were commuting all the way back to Grasmere to do the job and stories like that. And in a way, with COVID happening, we've put a more priority on to the fact that key workers are people like people working in retail. And yes, that's changing, but also the care workers, all these people who've kept the communities going and I know pre-COVID, I was chatting to somebody who runs a care firm and they were worried because tourism is beginning to put the wages up, which is good in many ways because they're desperately trying to attract people in and Brexit's going to change the situation on that. But they were then worried because they can't compete wage-wise to get care workers. And we're going to need more care workers with so many people who've retired to the Lake District, not got family here, getting older. And yeah, so it's all, that problem of uh, um, Lorraine mentioned of aging population and um, a lot of our workforce is older and are going to be retiring. What jobs are going to be coming available from 